Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. I want to greet you in the name of Jesus. I'd like to continue uh, this morning uh, the series I'd hope to do on the Christian family. And uh, by way of review, it was sort of an introduction the last time, and uh, we, we thought or talked a little bit about um, the symbiotic relation between the church, uh, the church family, and our uh, than the Christian family, and how that uh, they both need each other uh, in order to thrive. And one of the quotes we read is, if you're going to understand the Christian family, it needs to be within the context of the church family, that we do not exist as Christian families as separate entities and on our own, but we exist as Christian families within the context of God's family, and it is with the frame within the framework of the family of God that we discover the support and encouragement that we desperately need in the raising of our children. And so I want to uh, keep that as a background or sort of a backdrop as we think about the family. Remember that we're not doing this as a, as a separate uh, little unit, uh, but that there is a, a larger context in which this all uh, gets worked out. It's part of a bigger picture. And what we want to talk about this morning is also part of a bigger picture. Uh, in the discussion uh, this morning, I would like to think about marriage. Uh, when we think about family, uh, it's pretty uh, logical that in order to have a family, there needs to be marriage. And so that would be what I would like to talk about this morning. You can turn on uh, your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. sort of jumping in here a little bit, but it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper, comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper, comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife. And we're not ashamed. You can turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept, but from the beginning of creation... God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And uh, then you can, uh, let's just continue there. In the house, his disciples asked him again on the same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And then uh, turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 32. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to her, her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. On September 19th, 2014, Apple launched the iPhone 6. Three days later, more than 13 million were already in use. Not only had Apple succeeded in making an incredible product, it had massfully marketed it. Millions watched breathlessly as the CEO and watched uh, CEO announced the latest phone and its incredible new features. Yet, if you watch the presentation, you will notice that he did not say, note how this elegant piece of machinery can be jammed under a door as a doorstop. We are revolutionizing door room entry. Or, note how the sleek design will allow you to smoothly spread butter across toast. Why? Because it was not what it was created for. The makers of the iPhone understood that the highest potential will be reached and the greatest satisfaction experienced if its creation is used in accordance with its design. This is true of all things. Freedom is not the absence of boundaries. It is the ability to fulfill created intent. A fish is most free when it swims. A bird is most free when it flies. And for all of life, the highest potential will be achieved and the greatest satisfaction experienced if we live in accordance with our Creator's intended design. And uh, that's a, a quote from a book uh, by uh, a man by the name of Stort about, about marriage. And, you know, that is so true. And it's true for the family, and it's true for marriage uh, as well. Uh, our greatest uh, satisfaction is going to be experienced when we follow God's uh, blueprint for marriage. And it, it goes along really well with the verse that he wrote up here, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. Marriage and family are God's design. Let's not forget that. It's, it's not a social construct. I think a lot of t in our society today, a lot of people view marriage as somehow some kind of a social construct. It's something that was created by society to sort of meet some kind of a need. But we need to constantly come back to the thing is this was God's idea. He is the architect of it. It's his design. And it only and only when we uh, follow his design uh, is it going to be successful and is it going to be, uh, be a workable. Paul in Ephesians, when he was arguing, uh, uh, when he was speaking about marriage, wasn't arguing from the context of first century uh, life. He, was, he constantly went back. He said... Uh, you know, for, um, man shall leave his father and mother. He goes back to, to, Gen uh, to Genesis chapter 2, verse 31. You'll have to forgive me, but my mind works kind of funny sometimes. And uh, as I was thinking about this subject, uh, sometimes I think about, well, I mean, I'm sort of preaching to the choir. We know all this. We, we know all this stuff. And yet, uh, in the story, uh, in the Narnia series, in the story of the silver chair, Scrub, Jill, and Puddle Glum are sent on a mission uh, to find a lost prince. His name was Rillian. He disappeared, and he disappeared for 10 years. And uh, long story short, they finally found him. He was in the underworld, down under, uh, and he was under the power of, a, of an evil witch. Uh, she was beautiful, but she was evil. And uh, they happened to find him at a time when the, the queen was out, and he was... Uh, tied to a chair, a silver chair, and uh, he was allowed to roam freely because he was under a, a, he was mad, he was under a spell, um, and he could not, could not think uh, clearly. But there was a particular time during the day that he would, he would actually be able to think logically and clearly, uh, actually
actually think about the truth. And during that time, she would bind him to the silver chair so that he could not get loose. And they, uh, they happen to find him at a time where he is not uh, uh, tight to the chair. They, they free him from that, uh, and then the witch comes back. And uh, she throws a powder onto the fire that's burning, and a sweet smell started to, to come out from that. And then she began to strum on some kind of an instrument. And uh, this smell started to permeate uh, their minds. And she started to say, there is no sun. They were talking about the sun. They were down under the dark. And they, and they were talking about how great, great it was. Now, there is no sun. Uh, there is no Narnia. There is no Aslan. And, and they found themselves being lulled. Uh, to sleep by the strumming and they would have their moments where they would get a no wait a minute this is not true this is not right and then the strumming would go on and they 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 were and finally puddle glum stomps out the fire and uh they were able to regain their their senses and uh at that point the witch turns into a, a serpent which they're able to destroy I say you'll have to forgive me, but as I was thinking about this subject, that, that picture came into my mind. I think there's an awful lot of, of strumming, and there's an awful odor in our, in our society today that has penetrated our society to the point where if we're not careful, I think it has more of an effect on us than what we think. I mean, we're in, a, we're in an age today where, I mean, everything is up for grabs. I mean, it's... It's, it's gay marriage. What, that's a, a, an oxymoron. Uh, and not only marriage, but even in family life and, and things. I, I just recently heard about this whole idea of gentle parenting. Uh, and it's coming into Christian circles where, you know, God's designed for discipline for the family. I mean, it, w there's no physical discipline whatsoever. Uh, it's all we, we, we try to help them learn. I'm saying our society, there's, there's an odor. There's an odor permeating our society. There's a strumming going on that affects our, uh, and I think it's time for us to, to just stop and stomp the fire out and say, what does God's word say? There's literally strumming going on, and we know that by the, by the songs. 1971, the year I was born, 50-some uh, years ago, just after the 60s, uh, Johnny Mitchell, who was probably uh, a singer that epitomized that whole hippie movement and so on, there was a song that she wrote. He's my, my old man. He's a singer in the park. He's a walker in the rain. He's a dancer in the dark. And this is the refrain that keeps going through that song. We don't need no piece of paper from the city hall keeping us tied and true. It's horrible grammar wants to start with, um, but it's a horrible idea. Uh, and it, the song goes on, and it, that refrain is repeated. We don't need no piece of paper at City Hall to keep us tried and true. Uh, about 18, 19 years later, uh, there was another number one hit song. Um, has words that go something like this. It's only the thrill of boy meeting girl. Opposites attract. It's physical, only logical. You must try to ignore that it means more than that. What's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? Number one hit song in the United States uh, on the charts. Strumming. It's things that are in our society. And uh, so we, we see, you know, we don't need a piece of paper. Now what's love got to do with it? It's just, our, it's just physical. It's just go experiment, go try. And I guess I was really made aware of this uh, some Right there before, uh, before our prison services stopped, one of the last services I had in there, there was a group of men came out, a young man came out there, and somewhere during the discussion, uh, the whole idea of marriage came up. And I, I was just uh, very shocked to discover that the whole concept of marriage, uh, that it was even necessary, that there was a moral connotation to the whole thing, did not exist in his mind. And I think he was honest. He said, where does that come from? Uh, 
I just thought if you were, love somebody and you're committed to them, you know, and even the other prisoners, some of the other men in the Bible study were saying, no, no, it's in the Bible. You know, you have to, you have to, be, uh, you have to be married. And just to give, give you a little idea of how this strumming and this uh, odor in our society has, has made a change, uh, in the early 60s, under 3% of couples lived together before they were married. Under 3%. By 2015, it's estimated that 70% of couples cohabitate before marriage. 70%. In 2019, a survey was done, 78% of ages 18 to 29 say that it's acceptable to live together even if you don't plan to be married. And so it's time, I, again, I, I, I want to bring this up just, be, just to reinforce in our minds uh, that there is only one way, and that's the way that, that God has ordained it to be. Uh, it's time to stamp out the fire, uh, the seducing fire, uh, the sweet seducing fire, and tune out the hypnotizing strumming and firmly lay hold on the word of God and what he says. And God is clear what marriage is. It's one man, one woman for life. It's simple. It's very simple. It's to leave and to cleave till death parts us. And it's because of that that it, marriage is actually a very, it's a very, uh, sacred thing. It's a, it's a very serious thing. And a lot of times in, in marriage, uh, there, there's a statement made, uh, something like this, marriage is a special and unique relationship appointed by God. It is set apart in scripture as honorable in all and conveys the wonderful spiritual union between Christ and his church. It is therefore not to be entered upon lightly or carelessly, but thoughtfully with reverence for God, with due consideration for the purposes for which it was established by God, which are three. So here's the three, basically the three purposes for marriage. The lifelong help and comfort and companionship which husband and wife are to give each other. Two, the well-being of family life so that the children who are a gift from the Lord might be trained to love and obey God. And three, for the welfare of human society which 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 can be strong and healthy only when the marriage bond is held in honor. And I think we see a, a, a very much uh, that working itself out and playing itself out in our society where, where marriage is not held in honor, where it's, uh, our society disintegrates and falls apart. But I'd like to sort of concentrate this morning on the marriage relationship itself, the lifelong help and comfort and companionship which a husband and wife are meant to give each other. Maybe we'll touch on uh, the individual roles uh, within that in, an, in another message. Just got an email uh, from Pablo Yoder, I'm on his email list, and uh, he, he was uh, writing about a wedding he attended, which he was very happy with. Uh, he was in, uh, giving um, commendation. But he had a lament there. He said, um, a, a lamenting what is happening in a lot of churches today. He said, the hands-off policy is being mocked. Involving parents and ministers is a thing of the past. Social dating is promoted, and saddest of all, on the wedding day, the celebration is not about Christ and his church. God is barely mentioned. It becomes a mere social celebration of the couple's love. Of course, a wedding is about celebrating the couple's love for each other, but without having God's divine love, first of all, the human romantic love a couple might have for each other dies very soon. And uh, I think he touches on something that's a, a, a very important, important thing that we see in marriage, especially in our, in our day today, and that is marriage has become very self-centered. Uh, what does it do for me? Uh, what can I get out of this? And so I'd like to think here for just a little bit about the nature of the marriage covenant. Uh, marriage is a covenant relationship. It's not a contract. Uh, the word covenant has the idea of cutting. Uh, that's actually what the word means. And uh, we have that very graphic illustration uh, of the covenant that God made with Abraham there in Genesis chapter 15 where he takes the animals, a heifer and uh, some pretty major animals, and he cuts them in half and he lays the pieces out, uh, sort of like one side here and one side there. And normally uh, when a covenant was made, you would have both parties would walk down between those animals, and it was a graphic sign of 
what happened if you break that covenant? I mean, it's death. It's, it's a tearing apart. And, of course, with Abraham's case, God walked that path himself uh, and made it. And the Bible says it's because he swore by himself. Uh, he made that covenant that he was going to keep with the children of Israel. And so it, it's, it's a serious thing. And there's, it's sort of a, a very, um, almost a dark picture there when we see that whole thing with this uh, furnace going between the, uh, the, these parts and so on. And, and so the, a covenant is something that has a lot of, of, of weight to it. It's something that's serious. And uh, there, there's some differences between a covenant and a, and a contract. And I'd just like to highlight some of those. A contract is temporary. You typically, on a contract, you, you put a time limit on it. This is going to be the way it is until. Um, covenants are permanent. And we know the covenant that God made with his people. He says, I'm never going to. I'm never going to abandon that covenant. And, of course, with Jesus, he's, he fulfilled that, and we, we are a benefit of that today. Contracts downplay forgiveness. Uh, covenant emphasizes forgiveness. When you think about a, 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 a contract, there's, there's nothing in a contract about forgiveness. Covenant... It's, it's about a relationship where forgiveness uh, is at work. Covenants do not emphasize personal virtue. Um, a contract a contract does not emphasize personal virtue, but a covenant does. You know, we can have a contract with the, with the phone company, and we don't have to be honest or gentle or kind or anything like that. As long as we pay our bill, we're okay. But when, in a covenant relationship, it's important uh, that our personal virtue and, and the kind of character we have, that's why we believe in courtship, uh, because it's a, it's a kind of a relationship where uh, our, the virtue, uh, our personal character is, and there's, there's, a, moral, there's a moral component uh, to it. Moral obligations are present. Uh, a contract, there's none of that. In a contract, there's a relational detachment. Uh, a covenant implies intimacy. Uh, Genesis 2.25, the verse we read, says they were both naked and they were not ashamed. And, uh, you know, there's this idea around uh, in our society anymore that the whole uh, sexual relationship is just an experiment. It's just something physical. And it, uh, no, there, it, it comes with, with it comes a whole set of emotional and, and uh, just a whole lot comes with that. And it, God in his wisdom reserved that only for marriage. And, and a covenant relationship implies that there's intimacy there. A contract, there's none of that. In a contract, my needs come first. And a, a covenant places the relationship first. Uh, a covenant is fundamentally not a self-serving agreement. A contract is. A covenant involves holiness. A contract does not. Holy means to be set apart for a higher purpose. So when you marry your spouse, you, your, she, that spouse becomes set apart. No other person in the world deserves the same level of commitment, respect, honor, and attention uh, the, the relationship you share as a husband and wife is like no other. So there's uh, holiness involved. A contract assumes a level of distrust. Think about it. It's, it's a little bit like when you swear an oath. It's like you have to swear because there's a good chance you're going to be telling a lie. So now I'm going to make doubly sure. A contract is, assumes sort of a, a distrust. A coven, covenant relationship is an expectation of trust. Uh, a contract protects in, if conditions are broken. So if you, you do this, then this is the consequence. And, and it's assuming that there's going to be some kind of distrust. Contract, and a contract is individualistic. Uh, and then a covenant assumes a witness 
uh, of a community of faith. So with, with a covenant, there's witnesses to this. This is beyond just a little something, little thing we, we come up with, but uh, it's not individualistic, but it involves the whole community. And it's because of that reason, the marriage vows that we make uh, before witnesses are very important, and what we say in those vows are very important. And if you think about it, uh, the vows that we make have very little to do with our feelings. Very little to do with our feelings. It, but it, it's all about an act of the will. And there's a sort of a trend today to write your own vows. And I'm not saying that's all, all wrong. But a lot of times, I believe they come up short of what God, uh, or what we should really uh, expect in our marriage vows. I remember I had a cousin who, uh, it's been 30-some years ago, but there's a, a phrase that they, they said their own vows to each other. Uh, and there was a phrase in there. Uh, they said, I promise not to try to change you, but I will accept the changes you make on your own. And that was one of the phrases that they, they uh, had in there. Today that marriage is, is done. It's history. Uh, broken. I remember when one of my uncles who was not what I would call a, a, a devoted believer come out and said, they didn't promise anything in there. Uh, and, you know, a lot, a lot of those kind of things become sentimental. Uh, you know, the night I met you, the earth moved, you know, and those kind of things that people start in, in their vows. But I want us to just listen a little bit. Will you in the presence of God take to be your wedded wife? Will you love and cherish her, providing care for her in health and in sickness, in prosperity and adversity? Exercise patience, kindness, and forbearance. Why do we have to, to say that? It's because it's a covenant. And, and, and uh, it's, it's about the act of the will that I'm saying, because of this covenant that I'm making, I am going to stick to this through thick and in thin. Not just in the good times, not just when my emotions are in the right place. Live with her in peace as becometh a faithful Christian husband and vice versa for the wife. So to sum it all up, a contract uh, versus a covenant. A contract is, I will if. A covenant is, relationship is, I will because. I will because I've made this vow, because I've made this commitment. Not I will if you keep your end of the bargain. I will if things go well. I will if, if our life continues on in, in a good way. I'd like to use an acrostic a little bit. Just this is not original with me, but just to sort of just sort of maybe give us a little bit of a, a framework to think about marriage here. The acrostic is tulips. T stands for theology. Um, theology simply means God, how how God God's word or how God thinks. The word theo is God. Logos is, is his word. So it's basically, what does God think about this? We already touched on that. Marriage was instituted by God. Uh, and Ephesians says it points beyond uh, just the, the marriage, but it points to a great mystery, and that mystery is the mystery of Christ and his church. That God, through Jesus, would uh, love those who by nature were indifferent to him. <laughs> And in marriage, the husband models this self-giving love, and the wife demonstrates the church's response as she submits to her husband. So a couple then is living out by God's grace in marriage what God has intended to be a powerful uh, apologetic for the gospel. The marriage, in a sense, is like a mural. It's like a mural that we're painting, uh, a picture. We have theology, we have unity. Ephesians 5.31, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Marriage is a voluntary thing. Um, we don't get married by an act of Congress or um, an act of Parliament, but it's a choice we make. One man, one woman from, from different families. The man leaves his family, cleaves to his wife, who is from a different family. And... 
they remain who they are in a sense, and yet uh, they, so the Bible says they become one flesh. And so it's no longer you do your thing and I'll do mine and then we'll get together now and then, but there's a unity that happens. Uh, individual lives are transformed. Loyalty. Until you were married, your loyalty was to your parents, your mom and dad. There's a new loyalty. The Bible is clear. Leave your father and mother. Cleave to your wife. Cut the apron strings. Um, that's a, sometimes parents have a hard time doing that, but cut the apron strings. A new loyalty. I, intimacy. Bible's clear that public promise precedes private pleasure. So in, in, again, we're back to this thing of in God's order, in God's way, in God's time. God has created boundaries, moral boundaries, and the only right and satisfying place for sex is within the covenantal, covenantal bond of marriage. Uh, P for priority. Ephesians 5.30 3 says, however, let each of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she reverence her husband. And this is a quote. In a nutshell, our priority in marriage is this, that the love of Christ for his church might be seen in the microcosm that is the husband's love for his wife and that the submission of the church to Christ might be mirrored in the submission of a wife to her husband. That's different from what am I getting out of this relationship? Priorities. And then S for sanctity. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. If we follow God's plan for marriage, then he smiles upon it. He puts his stamp of approval on it and blesses it. Uh, and it's sanctified. It becomes right. It becomes holy. It becomes a thing of beauty. Then I'd like to think just a little bit about marriage as a, as a mission. We talked about marriage being a mural that we're painting to, to, to show forth uh, what, uh, what God wants. After marriage, then what? Do you ever think about that? So we get married, uh, we go on our wedding trip, we come back, and it's like, well, then what? Where do we go from here? What is the purpose? You know, many, many people start to try to pursue satisfaction with, uh, again, selfish uh, pursuits, um, accumulating stuff. Maybe it's building a, um, a secure financial future. Um, but if our marriages are to be a mural or a monument to the gospel, then our pursuit must be kingdom-driven. It has to be. And I like this quote from uh, Ben Stewart. Uh, he says, we are not simply meant to stare into each other's eyes. We are meant to link arms and run together after a common mission. C.S. Lewis's observation on friendship applies well to marriage. The very condition of having friends is that we should want something else besides friends. Friendship must be about something. Those who have nothing can share nothing with those who are going no. Those who have nothing can share nothing. Those who are going nowhere can have no fellow travelers. The strongest marriages are those in which the husband and wife are truly friends. As friends, they grasp each other's hands and run together after a common mission. And the more compelling the vision, the stronger the bond. In marriage, we grab the hand of the other and run out into the world together to fulfill our God-given mission. In this way, marriage is not only a picture of Christ and his church to the world, it is also a pursuit of Christ's vision for the world. Your marriage will be most fulfilling and most secure when it's on a mission. And I like that idea, marriage on a mission. And probably no one has... Uh, espouse this more than Priscilla and Aquila. I don't know if you ever thought about Priscilla and Aquila. You know, in Acts 18, Paul meets them in Corinth, and it says that they were just recently displaced from Italy. So because of the emperor, someone had displaced them. They had, were displaced from their home, and they, uh, they come to Corinth, and there Paul meets them. And 
It says they, Paul stayed with them for like a year and a half, uh, and they were tent makers. And so we see the hospitality that just sort of oozes out of, out of uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Then uh, he goes to Ephesus, and it says Priscilla and Aquila went with him. And then after they were in Ephesus for a while, uh, Paul goes back to Antioch, and, and Priscilla and Aquila remain at, in, in Antioch. And they find themselves sort of in an awkward position because there's this man called Apollos who comes along who's very eloquent and starts teaching in the synagogues, but he's not, uh, he only knows the uh, baptism of John. Or he, he's, he's, uh, and so it says that Priscilla and Aquila took him aside and explained to him the way of God more perfectly. Uh, they were willing to, be, to step up to the plate, so to speak. They were willing to, to be used and, and say, what can we do to be part of the, the solution? And it's always Priscilla and Aquila. It, it, it just always, and oftentimes Priscilla's name's first. Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila. So they were hospitable. They, they were willing to say, what can we do to be a part of the, of the solution? And then uh, they were faithful. And Paul mentions them in three of his other letters. Um, in 1 Corinthians, he talks about the church that is in their house. He mentions them in Romans. And then in 2 Timothy, which is the last book that Paul writes, um, it's like 10 years after uh, some of the other books, uh, he tells Timothy uh, to greet Pro Aquila and Priscilla. So there they are, still serving, still faithful after all that time. And I was just really, really encouraged by, by that. Is, is that the kind of model that we're, we want to model for our, our young couples as they get married and for us older ones. Marriage with a mission. It's not just that we get married and we stare into each other's eyes and, and we start pursuing the American dream. But if, if, our, if our marriages are to be a, a mural, to be an example, to be an advertisement for, uh, for the gospel, then we need to have a mission. Your marriage is safest when it's on a mission. Our marriages are a picture of Christ's love for His church, and our marriages are a pursuit of Christ's purposes on earth. Our marriages are a mural and a mission. To the degree that we take up His values of loving one another while we pursue the, His vision of extending the fame of Jesus around the world for the good of all people, we will have a strong and successful marriage. I promise you, your marriage is safest when it is on a mission. Nothing forges stronger bonds of love than a mutual commitment to a com compelling mission. And, I just really like that. What are, what are we involved in? And, you know, your mission may be different from mine. Um, if you have children, one of your primary missions is to raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Um, but I can assure you that your uh, satisfaction isn't going to be found in the pursuit of the American dream. Uh, having, you know, the next house or the, the next uh, form of entertainment. And you know, the evil one does not want our marriages to succeed. And he's out there to destroy in any way he can. And that, as I said before, the, the, the odors permeating in the, the uh, society, things are strumming. And, and, and if we're not careful, we can be lulled to sleep. And so just in closing here, I would like to um, just give some tips. And again, these are, not all, these are things I've gleaned. Um, to help safeguard our marriages. Just some things that we should not do and some things that we should do. Um, Satan's out to destroy them, and he doesn't care who it is. Uh, and sometimes we feel like, ah, we're safe. You know, there's a terrific amount of, of security comes when, when divorce is not an option. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a tremendous sense of peace and, and security that we find in that, that the world does not have. Uh, I'm amazed how many people live in that kind of a fear. And yet Satan is, is determined. And, you know, we, we all unfortunately have, have uh, way too close home situations where marriages have, have fallen apart and have, have, uh, are not what they should be. And so I'm going to give these without a lot of comment. Number one, don't be so foolish as to think it could never happen to me. Uh, rarely, you know, rarely does a, a marital problem, uh, a serious problem, come in one big, 
like a, like a missile. Um, it happens in little, little details here and there. 1 Corinthians 10 says that he that think he stands, take heed lest he fall. That doesn't mean we live in fear, uh, this paralyzing fear, uh, but it does mean that we have a real realistic sense that we are not beyond uh, the, the ability to, uh, to fall. Do not assume good marriages just happen without hard work. You know, a garden unattended gets full of weeds. And uh, to have a good marriage means a lot of hard work. Uh, and we can't be, be lazy. Do not let the business of life, busyness of life, disguise neglect. I think that's very apt in our society today. The busyness of life. And when we, we say, oh, we're busy, and it's disguising neglect. Don't take each other for granted. Husbands, hold motherhood high. When you talk to other people about it, uh, your wife it plays a very, very important role. And, and hold that high. Don't take each other for granted. Do not compare your spouse unfavor, unfavorably with others in regards to looks or abilities. Do not take someone of the opposite sex into precincts that should be exclusive to marriage. Um, and there's, there's, there's places that are reserved strictly for husband and wife. And this is not just physical places, this is emotionally. And there's many of, of a pastor or counselor who's been, been caught up uh, in, in in sin because of, of bringing somebody into a place that they ought not to be. Don't dig up old failures and disappointments. Don't allow each other freedom that breeds neglect. You know, some people have this idea that uh, you do your thing, I'll do mine, and uh, we're, all, we're good with that. And that's a, that's a recipe uh, for neglect, and it's a recipe, a recipe for disaster. That's the negative. What can we do positively? We can pray daily for the health of our marriage and our families, every day. Be sacrificial in your love toward one another. Be imaginative, daring, and occasionally extravagant. You know, being righteous and holy in your relationship doesn't mean it has to be boring. Don't use children as either the glue or the wedge that holds you together or drives you apart. You hear that happening sometimes. Well, we're only here because the children are here. Be ruthless in resisting anything that you sense is uh, uh, damaging your relationship. So if there's something in your, in your, in your uh, life that you you realize it's damaging this. Be ruthless in resisting that and rooting it out. Be ready and willing to speak what is inside your head. And that just simply means we need to communicate with one another. Be certain that a great marriage is possible with God's help. And be aware how fast the time is passing. Seize the moment. Seize the day. You know, it's just amazing to me how fast time goes. And uh, so those are just some practical things uh, that we can, can look to. I just want to, again, emphasize in closing that the fact that we're living this out in, in, in the big picture. Uh, the, the kingdom of God and, and what he has in store and, and God, his church and the mystery of Christ and his church, uh, our families and our marriages all fit into that picture. And uh, we have a tremendous opportunity uh, to shine out as a light in this dark world uh, in our marriages. And uh, I, again, our, our society depends on good marriages. Our homes depend on good marriages. And uh, Satan knows that, and he's out to attack us. So I just want to encourage us, uh, let's, not be, uh, let's not be allured by the strumming, uh, the voices that are around us in our world. 
and let's stamp the fire out and return to the uh, to what God says, the Word of God. And Lord willing, uh, the next time we'll look at the, some of the specific roles inside marriage. What's the responsibility of the husband? What's the responsibility of the wife? Uh, then uh, the responsibility of children, and so on. Does anyone have any any comments?